to be so terribly loud. For me, frankly, it's too loud. I just can't bear it. I happen to have grown up in the string quartet, which is a bit softer. If one gets immune to this kind of sound, one may find it difficult to appreciate softer types of sound. Sid, yes, no? I don't think that's so. No. Uh, I mean, everybody listens. We don't need it very loud to be able to hear it. And with some of it, it's very quiet, in fact. Right. I, I th personally, I like quiet music just as much as loud music. We play in large halls and things where, where obviously volume is necessary. And when people dance, they like uh, volume, you know, comes in uh, on its own. But uh, when we play, I think uh, uh, the way the acts developed in the last six months has been influenced rather a lot by the fact that we've played in ballrooms yes. necessarily because, you know, th this is obviously the first market. Have but I think concerts have given us a chance to realise that maybe the music we play isn't directed dancing necessarily like normal pop groups. There's no shock treatment intended? No, certainly not. You know, some people think that we deliberately try and um, sort of uh, shock. shock the audience and make them, you know, by the volume and keep them quiet sort of thing, yes. but this isn't so. Long before I met him, about a year before I met him, I had to see him around Cambridge, and he stuck out in the crowd. He was so different. He just shone. He had the spring in his heel. He just was radiant. He had longish hair. He'd either be wearing a fisherman's jumper and skin-tight jeans, wrinkled pickers. Next time you saw him, dark glasses, John Lennon hat, plastic Mac, tight jeans, wrinkled pickers. But he just stuck out the way, he just threw out some kind of charismatic energy, you know. And I thought then, I want to know that guy. Sid was so talented that even though may, may have been some of his last words in, in, in the context of the Floyd, his last recorded words, he still managed to make something of it which has got its own inner beauty. I think that's extraordinary. The black and green scarecrow was sadder than me But now he's resigned to his fate as well as telling pain he doesn't mind Sid obviously made music that hits people at a certain age in their life because he gets discovered by the young continuously. There's a certain romance about the myth, but the romance about the myth wouldn't last if the music didn't have something in itself. I first met Sid in 1964. I was um, in Cambridge, centre of Cambridge, um, just walking around the back streets. And there was a load of mates, five or six of them, and Sid happened to be there. I was introduced to him, and it was outside a boutique called uh, Paraphernalia. And for somehow, I went into this weird kind of spiel, and I said something like, it was an ambiguous day under a blazing sun that hammered down on us, which caused paraphernalia. Sid actually laughed, head back, ah! And we hit it from that moment. And that's how I first met him. A friend of mine said, oh, I'm, I'm going over to see a friend. You want to come along? And I said, oh, why not? So I went along. And it was the house of Sid and his mother. And this guy, Adrian, Adrian Taylor, he says, um, this is Sid. And we just looked at each other and, and laughed. And he said, oh, you know each other? I said, oh, yeah. So um, after that, I used to go around and see Sid quite a lot at his house. And then one particular evening, I called over and he said, oh, I'm going over to see a friend, which was Storm Thor Thorgerson, who, who, who later became part of the Floyd, doing the graphics for their album. 
And so we, were, we wandered off walking into the centre of Cambridge over, I think it was called Christ Peace. There's a big park in the middle of Cambridge. And we'd started looning around, um, doing cartwheels and laughing and joking. And, and I did a couple of flips and I landed wrong and I, I actually uh, severely bruised both my ankles. So Sid said, right, we'll get a bus up to the hospital. And he kind of got me to the main road. Fortunately, another friend was going by on his Vespa, Dave Gale, and Sid flagged him down. He said, take Pete to the hospital. He's hurt himself. And what, strap him up. When he comes back, um, you know, back to my house. And I stayed there for four days. So I, I was around Sid for four days at his mother's house. And that's when we really got to know each other a bit more. And he was painting. He was doing his pop art stuff at the time. He, he was, had a huge, quite a big canvas. And it was circles within circles, quite thick circles. And they were all different colours. So he was going through like the spectrum of colour, the rainbows. But I didn't really talk to him about what he was doing. I just watched him paint. And he was a... You know, he was there every day. He'd be up, you know, from 10 in the morning till afternoon. He'd paint, have a break and pick up the guitar and we'd have a chat and play. It was four days. I mean, sometimes I'd be a bit of talking, discussing about music, playing the radio, analysing stuff. I can remember the Trogs when they come out, Wild Thing, and I said to him, what do you think about the Trogs and do you like it? And he said... I said, I like it, but it's so commercial. If it wasn't for the bloody ocarina, it would be really good. And he agreed, you know. At that time, there was a, a, a body, a group of people that were very much into the blues, um, R&B scene um, from Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, uh, Rolling Stones, of course. And there was a group of people... Um, which formed, I don't know, uh, there was about three, four different bands um, with this group of people, and you didn't know who was going to be playing, you know, at what time, because the personality changes, the uh, name of the band changed, um, so there was the Hollering Blues, uh, Blues Anonymous, and Such Sweet Thunder. Now, those three bands were more or less the same people, but they would add or get rid of somebody. Sid was part of that. And I was called up on stage on, for two numbers. One was a Rolling Stones, Walking the Dog, which I kind of whistled and sang back in vocals. The other song was a Jimmy Reed number, Baby, What You Want Me To Do, where I played harmonica. So, I mean, I played quite an insignificant part in this but I was part of that scene but just doing it for fun we were doing we were experimenting I guess we were just finding our way where obviously Sid was more into I not making it big I don't think that ever crossed his mind but he really enjoyed what he was doing and when he was there at the practice he kind of led the way it was him that kind of gave ideas and instructions to do this or do that you know so it was, it was a very interesting time Sid left Cambridge. He knew that he was going to London. Um, we all knew that he was going off to London to, to, to uh, go to art school. And I think it was out the art school um, that he had met certain musicians. I think Roger Waters was obviously one of them, also a Cambridge guy. Um, they already had a band, I think, and he was invited, Sid was invited to play with them, which he did. And he kind of led the way, I think. He got into something totally different. I don't actually remember when I met Sid. I don't remember where I met Sid. Just suddenly he was part of my life. 63, to 64 I was at architecture school, 64 I started art school. Somewhere along the line all the Pink Floyd became part of my, my world. I remember Roger being uh, more vocal and more articulate and more 
driven perhaps than any of the others. You know, Nick was very quiet, Rick was very quiet. Um, and all the time I spent with them, I don't remember much conversation with either of them. So it was Roger and, and Sid, and Sid was jovial and jolly and wanting to play. We had a flat that was on two floors, and they were, we were on, I was on the top floor, and they would be rehearsing on the top floor, and it would sometimes just drive me mad, and I'd have to go downstairs, and I'd put on American Rhythm and Blues as loud as I could, because I thought they had no sense of rhythm. And I thought maybe subtly this would get into them. But, uh, you know, it was sort of a lot of, uh, a lot of noise, a lot of, um, they didn't know where they were going. I wasn't sure I particularly liked all their directions. Some of it I did like, some of it I didn't. But at the same time, you know, then I would go to rehearsals that were out of the flat and performances, and obviously there was something special happening with them at the same time. So, mixed emotions. I hadn't seen Sid for quite some time. He'd come back to Cambridge occasionally, and if there was a music scene going, he would join in and play guitar or whatever. But uh, I lost contact with him for a bit. And the next I heard about Sid, he was on the radio Pink Floyd, Arnold Lane. And I thought, bloody hell, you know, this is my mate up there doing it. Brilliant. UFO Club it originated in a thing called the London Free School in Notting Hill and uh, um, among the, the people who set up the London Free School were Andrew King and Peter Jenner who, who later on turned out to be the first managers of the Pink Floyd. At any rate, it was, um, the Enterprise stumbled along in, in, the, in, in the summer of 1966 in Notting Hill but it was always short of money and we decided to run uh, a benefit at the local church hall and somehow or other uh, we got the Pink Floyd to play there. It, it got to be rather popular because it was the first time anybody used light shows and 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 a band at the same time. And people got quite turned on by this. Joe Boyd turned around to me one day and said, look Hoppy, if we can find a venue in the West End, why don't we, why don't we take this to the centre of town and turn it into a club? So I looked at him and after five seconds later I agreed. And then we went on the hunt for some premises. We found a place in the Tottenham Court Road and we opened the UFO Club just before Christmas in 1966. A lot of their stuff was what I would call pastoral or childlike, which was probably due to Sid Barrett. And, and his part of the creativity, because after Sid went, there was a really, if not a total absence, there was much less of this sort of childlike, if you like, innocent, uh, yearning sort of stuff. And there was much more of the sort of monumental sledgehammer approach. I mean, I don't say that in a negative way, but um, four people, managed to make a huge amount of sound and that was something in itself. I got them a deal with Polydor and everybody was very happy um, and at the same time I was, Hoppy and I also started this club called the UFO Club. 
And so they were playing at the UFO club at the same time that I was. I brought somebody from Polydor down to see them. They loved them. They said, yes, here you go. And we set up, I set up my production company for the purpose of recording the Floyd. I got a call from Jenner to say that they've been very impressed with Arnold Lane. They, we played the song for them. They thought it was great. And they could get us a much better deal with EMI than the deal we had with Polydor. And I was crushed, of course, because the Polydor was my deal. It was going through my production company. And, <clears throat> but they wanted me to produce the single. And I said, well, I'll do, the, I'll, I'll do that, but I want to be assured that I'll be the producer of the album that follows the single. And Brian Morrison said, well, EMI doesn't like to be tied down like that. Somewhat reluctantly, but I didn't, I felt, well, if I do a good job on the single, you know, they'll want to keep the team together. And um, so we went in the studio. We made Arnold Lane and the B-side Candy and the Current Bun. And then subsequently, EMI loved the record, signed them, gave them a big contract and uh, said, we're going to use our in-house producer, so thanks very much. And that was the end of my professional relationship with Floyd. When I first met them in the autumn of 66, you know, Roger was the the strong character, he was the spokesman in a way. Although everybody had something to say. Um, but Sid was a great kind of sparkly-eyed, witty, funny, charming guy who, you know, girls loved him and he was... Um, um, I got along very well with him. He was a very nice guy and very easy to talk to and, you know, and he continued to be pretty much like that all during the sessions, the recording sessions, and the gigs at UFO, January, February, March of 67. And then there was a period from March till May when I didn't really see them very much. And I ran into um, Sid and his girlfriend, Lindsay, at, um, in Cambridge Circus one evening in May. And, um, and she looked really worried, and he was just lying in the gutter. And, um, and she told me that he'd been taking acid every day for seven days. And, um, and she looked really anxious. And then when they came back and played in June, um, Sid was no longer the same Sid. He was kind of like nobody home and the glint was gone from his eyes and you know and he just stood on stage and didn't often and went long stretches without playing the guitar at all that night and you could see the rest of the guys were you know really didn't know what to do but they sort of worked through it and played <clears throat> you know Rick did long noodly you know keyboard solos and you know but it was very sad a man called Brian Morrison who was I'm not sure whether he yet had the signed agency of Pink Floyd but um, he was certainly looking for it, and he, he had uh, some good relationship with their management then, etc. And he came to me and he said, uh, well, there's this group called Pink Floyd. And I thought, what? Pink what? So he said, Pink Floyd. I said, what are they? He said, well, he said, they're, they're uh, appearing at UFO. I said, UFO? What's UFO? So then he told me, this underground freak out thing in Tottenham Court Road, you know. 
when I saw them, it wasn't so much them as the as the light show, uh, which was very impressive, you know. What they were playing, uh, loosely called music, um, didn't appeal to me very much because I, you know, I'm a jazz man from birth. And uh, so I didn't know too much about that kind of music or that kind of noise or whatever you might call it, you know. But anyhow, I didn't talk to them uh, uh, there. Uh, so Brian and I came away, we went out a drink, and he said, well, what do you think? So I said, uh, well, it's not so much the group, very impressive, their show, you know, the, the light show and all that. I said, but it's the number of people that were there, uh, fans of theirs. Uh, they were, it's, you know, it showed that they were extremely popular, and they were, I mean, I don't know if it was the drugs they were all taking, the, the fans or whatever, but uh, uh, they were extremely popular. So I said to Brian, yeah, well, I am interested. I might well have said that uh, to them and made it clear that I would be looking for a single, but they didn't set out to write a single at all. It was only my choice when I particularly heard C. Emily play. Up to that time, I thought, I'm not going to get a single. Uh, <laughs> but then when they, when they played me C. Emily play, I thought, ah, it, uh, it struck a note. You know, I thought, uh, I think I can make a single out of this which I did, and what I did, uh, and it was w one that I was really able to dress up in my own way as well, also, you know. And uh, I think Sid hated it, to be honest with you. In fact, I'm sure he did. He, he was not interested one little bit with singles. But I thought, I'd, please God, this is going to happen. And of course, fortunately, got to number two, I think it was. But then, as it uh, uh, started to climb up the charts, I thought the next thing that's going to happen is Top of the Pops. So I thought, well, I think the best thing I can do is to bring them into uh, EMI to let them see what would happen once they got into the Top of the Pops studio. Anyway, of course, I mean, <laughs> Sid did not perform at all uh, very well. And, and when it came to Top of the Pops, I mean, he, he virtually was motionless and didn't do a thing. Before they went on, they actually went into makeup, having hair washed and makeup, etc., hair set. I was waiting for them in their dressing room. They came back in out of makeup. As soon as they walked in, I saw Sid and he looked wonderful. The way they had styled his hair and the makeup. So straight away, I made the mistake of saying, Sid, you look absolutely wonderful. And he went, oh. And he walked over to the mirror, saw himself, he went, Ugh. and he immediately scruffed up all his hair, got tissues and started wiping off the, the makeup, etc. And I thought, what am I going to do with this guy? You know. Anyway, he went on like that. The second Top of the Pops, he was even worse because he stood there with his guitar just dangling, didn't even try to play it, head sort of bowed, a complete and utter, oh, nothing. And of course, I mean, I was furious. Uh, and that was the end of the Top of the Pops career. <laughs> I think he probably hated <coughs> going on top of the pops, doing the same thing over and over again. He just saw it as like miming. How can you mime? That's false. If you're going to get up there in front of the cameras, you've got to do it live, surely. Why mime? It becomes a very commercial hype. I don't know, it's just sending people up, isn't it?
Sid was into the experimental in music and being a pop star you're into repetition and you know you do a defined performance and you have to keep on doing it whereas Sid the big problem I think for him was that he was wanting to experiment continuously and couldn't just didn't have the discipline to repeat and repeat and repeat the same uh, you know so he would both challenge people when he should have been repeating because he wanted to do he didn't want it, it was too constrictive. I would bring them in after doing a take on a particular song, uh, bring them into the, the control room and then to make my suggestions, mainly to Sid because he was the mainstay, he was the writer and he was the big influence of the uh, psychedelic feeling amongst the rest of the group. In other words, he really was a kind of a leader I suppose. And uh, anyway, I would uh, listen to this tape with them and then afterwards say, mainly to Sid, because as I've said, I regarded him as the, the leader. When I suggest blah, 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 why don't you try this, that and the other instead of what you're doing at the moment? Try, try and, and then suggest, make a suggestion. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, okay, so would you, you know, go ahead with that and do another take and in the in the studio so he says yeah 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 okay uh, so off they would go back in the studio okay the engineers you know do not take so off we go he, <laughs> he would do exactly the self same show and so would they the self same thing he almost ignoring what I, either what I had said for suggestions and that and he'd come back in and I said okay we'll come back in and then I would say you know, you didn't, blah, blah, oh, did not Oh, no, no, that, that kind of thing, you know. Probably not wishing to do my suggestions of that particular kind. So I did have this with Sid Barrett to contend with, for not only for, you know, to one song, but many songs. Uh, so it was pretty damn difficult with, with Sid Barrett. Friendly enough, I, I mean, I was friendly enough with him, and particularly with the other boys, and I think, particularly Roger Waters, uh, Roger would show me, uh, he would gesture to me, you know, to when I, if, I, if perhaps I were talking to Sid and suggesting one or two things, he would make kind of sort of facial suggestions of that kind. <laughs> Will he do it? I don't, did he get what you're talking about? So, I mean, he was a bit dubious himself. That's the impression I got, anyway, from the other guys. But, of course, they were relying, were relying on him for songwriting, to write enough songs for, at least for this first album, Piper, uh, Gates of Dawn. Before the album came out, they actually came and played at um, art, the art school in Cambridge where Sid and myself had gone. And I saw them for the first time and I thought, I don't like this. You can't dance to it. It's not a, what I'm used to. It was loud, it was obscure, very abstract. Um, although I was very much into modern jazz at the time, especially John Coltrane. But I thought at least Coltrane has got some discipline about note to note where this sounded everything was at random and noise and some of us were trying to be cool and say yeah it's really good isn't it but inside your mind you were saying don't like this and when the paper the the the, the, the pipe at the gates of dawn came out i thought this is nothing like arnold lane something had obviously shifted uh with sid's thinking about you know taking music wherever I think the Interstellar Overdrive and 
the more kind of heavy kind of rock they they should have put that on another album i think if they'd have kept um like bike scarecrow the gnome if they'd have kept to that kind of genre it would have been a more fulfilling album i think but it was a kind to me it was like a mishmash you had folk folk rock then you had progressive psychedelic rock on one album so it was a bit disjointed if you analyze it now i mean looking back in retrospect i can now understand i can see sid um and i think he was taking on board his surroundings i mean he he loved he loved nature he loved walking in the country so when i hear things like scarecrow and the gnome it's very much very cambridge very english um it's to do it's to do with sid's little experiences whether he was on his own or whatever i mean even if he was you know probably in the city in london or whatever was happening around him he would somehow fit that into his writing the black and green scarecrow as everyone knows Sure, everywhere he didn't care. He stood in a field where barley grows. His head did no thinking, his arms didn't move, except when the wind cut up rough and mice ran around on the ground. He stood in a field where barley grows. There would be a period where I didn't really see much of Sid, which is when the Floyd really started taking off. Years later, years, years, years later, I read their touring schedule, and I thought, what madness. Whoever programmed them to run around England in the way they did, in the conditions they did, and I thought that would have been exhausting and debilitating for anyone, let alone throwing drugs, and uh, there was bound to be some kind of price for that, you yeah. know. It was just so illogical to have them driving here in England, then down there, then over there, then up there, sort of like that, and it's crazy. He stood in a field where barley They were booked to do the thing on radio, BBC Radio, called Saturday Club, with Brian Matthew. When you were booked for that, you would have to sit around until your time, until Brian had found time to bring you in. So sometimes there was quite a long wait before you went in to broadcast. Anyway, I was hanging about there, and then came the, the uh, call from Brian to come in, we looked around for Sid, couldn't find Sid. And uh, I, 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 where's Sid? So, oh, don't, I don't know. He was uh, drinking a cup of coffee or something or other. Oh, where the hell is he? Anyway, went to, uh, I, sat, I think it was a doorman that came up with the earshot of this. He said, well, I saw somebody leaving the, the, the front door. And I said, do you know what he looked like? Did, was, it, was it Sid? He said, I don't know. He said, but he looked as though he might be a musician. <laughs> a musician. <laughs> so Roger Waters the Dyer went down and, uh, uh, and out of the front door, looked up the road just to see Sid disappearing round the first turning. So Roger ran after him, brought him back. And that was really the start of his freak out and uh, the eventual leaving the group. And that was the first, well, it wasn't really the first signs for me, but it was the, the last final sign that uh, his, he was freaking out, that his, mentally something was missing, something was going. It's awfully considerate of you to think of me here, and I'm most obliged to you for making it clear that I'm not here. Sid seemed to have the ability to produce oddball lyrics but with melodies or tunes or riffs which managed to crystallize each one into something which was really brilliant. I mean, e even, even his 
terminal pieces like Jad Band Blues. Uh, still, they they have a they have a sort of musically rounded uh, um, nature, which you you know you wouldn't think that someone who is mentally in that condition could possibly produce anything. It's almost as if you know his his last words came out set to music. Was, is is what that feels like. So. He, he was a very special talent. Uh, no, he wasn't a genius, but he was very talented. And I mean, I think something must have happened to him early on in his life so that his brain became wired for music and lyrics. And it doesn't happen with many people. It has been said that Sid probably would have had a breakdown at some point. He was quirky, zany, before he went loopy. I mean, he was eccentric. I can remember him kind of saying, no rules, there's no rules, no rules. I mean, he was brought up in, an, uh, you know, his environment, being brought up as a kid, was very, very, very liberal. There were, there were no rules. He could do what he wanted. He was loved, he had security, money. Um, then his father died, of course, and um, but um, he was basically brought up with his mother. Um, I think doted on him, and I can remember she would bring tea and cakes and biscuits to us, and then he'd say, "Mum, fuck off." I said, "Okay, Sid," and laugh, like he could say anything. There was no disrespect; it was just the, the normal thing to do. I don't want you here now, Mum. Fuck off. Um, so, okay, Sid, and laugh it off, you know. Um, and I was impressed by that because I was brought up in a very kind of Victorian, very, very strict, um, you know, in, environment. And I, you know, I had to be in at certain times for my lunch, evening meal, wh whatever. I had to be that. If I was late, I got ribbed for it, you know. But he could just come and go and have all his friends around. He had his own room. Um, and he, that was enviable. Sid was the uh, lead vocalist and the lead guitar and the rhythm guitar, uh, uh, variously, and that's quite a heavy load to take take on. I mean, if you're if you're being the vocalist, you then at that point when you're singing, you're the centre of attention. But uh, a lot of the Floyd stuff was uh, instrumental and without words, particularly Interstellar Overdrive, which was like very long usually. And they've got lots of things in it, but it didn't have any words in it. So I think really what I'm saying is that um, part of the magic of the Floyd, the, the secret ingredient, was that the, the group as a whole was greater than the sum of the parts. And that's why the Floyd managed to survive after Sid left, because that essence of what they were doing together survived. And, and, and David Gilmore, who was already good friends with the group and had probably played and jammed with them a good, a good deal, and naturally stepped in to fill the gap left by, by Sid when he, when he split. I thought that they wouldn't last, you know, that without Sid, where are they going to get the songs, where are they going to get the the spark of genius, you know, that the other guys were great musicians and they had a wonderful sound and, you know, but I, the idea that they could carry on at the same level without Sid, to me, was impossible. In, in, in a way, one of the things that, that, in retrospect, you could say that they gained, maybe, by the next album, the taboo against songs longer than three minutes had been lifted in a way. There have been 
you know, different groups doing longer sort of extended instrumentals and things like that. And so they were able to put on record the way that they sounded in person much more. And in a way, as a guitar player, rather than as a songwriter, but as a guitar player, Dave Gilmore is probably more accessible than Sid was as a guitar player. If you'd had a record full of stuff like Interstellar Overdrive as the second record with Sid still in full control of his fac faculties, he might have written some very clever, wonderful songs, maybe better songs than appeared on subsequent Floyd records. But his way to fill a 10 minute stretch of instrumental was a lot more grating and hard for people to deal with, I think, mass market to deal with, than the sort of spacey blues guitar playing of Dave Gilmore, which is much more accessible. So in some ways, I think, given that that was the direction they were going in, to have longer and longer tracks and more emphasis on the instrumental component of the group, switching Sid for Dave Gilmore probably worked. There was a certain period in at that point in the 60s when the generalization was that fame and fortune and success were kind of irrelevant to people's lives, that creativity wasn't though, and the present wasn't. I never remember having a conversation with Sid about being a pop star until he wasn't. And then it was a significant memory of him going, I'm a failed pop star. But then he turned to me and said, but who are you? You're 23 and you're not famous. Then he turned to his girlfriend and said, you're just a waitress. And that was a real put down of all three of us. You know? It was just, it was devastating in the fact that it was, he was putting himself down as well. And it was like, you don't want your friends putting you down. I mean, the level of being put down on was kind of, I don't necessarily agree with that either. But, uh, you know, Sib was always challenging. When he was good, when he was bad. Got a flip top stack of cigarettes in the pocket, feeling good in the top, shopping at shops. Walking in the sunshine town, feeling very cool. But the butchers and the bakers in the supermarket stores getting everything she wants from the supermarket store. I came up to London in 68 and I was living, living in Shepherd's Bush. Got married down at Hammersmith and then moved to Earl's Court. My wife, my new wife from Cambridge, Jenny Hall, um, we were walking down um, the high street in um, oh God, Earl's Court. <laughs> and along came Sid's girlfriend, Lindsay Corner, saw me and said, oh, Pee Wee, what are you doing here? I said, well, we're just moving here. Where? Earl's Court Square. Well, that's where we live. Sid would love to see you. And lo and behold, they lived about four or five doors away from me. I was at number 10, there was at number five, I can't remember, number two, whatever. So I went round after not seeing Sid for about two years. And um, I knocked on the door, he opened it, he shook my hand. Pee Wee, it's lovely to see you, like normal. Got inside the room, there was no conversation. He would just... And I didn't think anything at the time. It didn't actually kind of dawn on me that anything was wrong. I mean, I hadn't seen him for two years, probably longer. Um, but we didn't stop long. We just kind of exchanged a little bit of, you know, how are you? And he said, oh, come, come and see me again. And it was a few weeks down the line. I went over one evening and um, completely different thing altogether. Um, knocked on the door, he said, hello, Pee Wee, come in. And he'd moved this table into the middle of the room. There was a stereo playing full blast, TV full blast, 
two chairs. We sat down and he just went blank. There was a stare and he stared right through me. And he just sat there peeling an orange like it was a globe or whatever, the universe. And I felt very kind of, it put me very uneasy. I felt, I started getting a little bit like, what's going on here? And I knew then something wasn't right, but I didn't know what. I put it down to, well, maybe he's just being super cool. He's a big rock star. Maybe he's just being super... But I didn't realise, no, it was more than that. So I, I left and I felt a bit paranoid, actually. He just stared right through you. And it was like greeting me at the door. Everything was hunky-dory. Then all of a sudden, there was nothing, like blank. And he had gone somewhere in his own mind. He was just gone. Then I hadn't seen him for maybe a month or so. And I was walking down Elscourt Road and this big white car pulls up and it was Dave Gilmore. And he said, um, he said, oh, he said, we're recording Sid down at Abbey Road. He said, do you want to come along? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. I've never been inside a recording studio. And I thought, well, why not? So we went along and Sid was already there behind this glass cabinet playing his guitar, well, not playing. Um, somebody said, well, Sid, um, what are you gonna do? How many songs have you got? He said, I've got a 12, 13. Well, what are you gonna do? He said, all of them. And I heard this guy in the background say, get him out of here. I mean, the way that Sid was playing the guitar was like running fingers down the fret at random without any, it was nonsensical. And then I knew there was something seriously wrong with him. And I thought, my God, I felt, I was looking at a pathetic character. And I felt very kind of like, ah, sad. I felt very sad. I thought, no, he's mad. And um, this guy said, oh, get him out of here. I can remember Dave Gilmore saying, no. He's, this was the second solo album and he was actually prepared and about to do dominoes. Dave Gilmore turned around to this guy, engineer, whatever he was, and said, no, I'm paying for this. He does what he wants. He was so adamant, no, he's going to do what he wants to do. You know, like, bog off, if you like. So that was said. They were going into Dominoes, which is a song that I love, and it will haunt me for the rest of my days. I think it's one of the best songs he's ever done. And he thought, well, you know, there, there was no band. There was, there was just him doing his guitar bit up and down the frets. And you're thinking, God, it's bloody awful, it's embarrassing. But it went on hour after hour after hour. And we were there from like lunchtime till like one in the morning. And they hadn't even completed one song. And I thought nothing more of it. And that was it. That's the last time I saw Sid. I'd moved back to Cambridge in 71, not realizing that Sid was back there at the same time as me. But we never had any contact after that. Um, Abbey Road recording. I think he was quite lost on the second one, uh, in that I remember going to the studio with him and Sid having to be told what to do, and then he would sort of sit there and just zone out, or he wouldn't know what he was supposed to do or he would start doing something and he didn't know if he was deliberately messing it up because uh, he would play mind games with people and you didn't know if that was deliberate or not. Um, that was the period where he started getting really, you know, and he wasn't, he was just closed off inside himself. I haven't listened to a lot of Sid's solo stuff. I mean, I've listened to it, but not over and over again. And I suppose, for me, I find it a little difficult to listen to because I, 
I'm kind of in mourning for two things. One is for the Sid that existed before the summer of 67. And the other for the tape <laughs> that he gave me that I lost, which had all these great, wonderful, simple, just guitar and voice versions of a lot of the songs that appear on those records. It was around the time we made Arnold Lane because he had, he mentioned in a conversation that he had um, a bunch of songs that the Floyd weren't using. And he was, I think at the time, quite prolific. He was writing a lot. And I was, I'd just been hired to record, um, in fact, the same week as I recorded Arnold Lane, I also recorded a single with a group from Macclesfield called The Purple Gang. And I had in mind that they could sing some of Sid's songs. And so I said, Sid, could you give me a tape of your song? So he just sat in front of a microphone and just strummed and sang the songs and gave me the tape. But then somehow I didn't end up doing a record with an album with them. And the whole thing just, you know, and those, you don't think about how important these things could be historically at the time. When you've met a person who's young, 18, 17, 18, and they're happy, laughing, joking, together, doing all nice things, creating, uh, from writing to painting to playing music, having laughter, good times, and then you see somebody with black holes staring through you and there was nothing there. I mean, I can remember walking down Ells Court Road, I'd bumped into him, and it was like being with a small child. I mean, he was, to me, he seemed dyspraxic. These are new labels that have come out. It seemed like he was a bit dyspraxic, or maybe <laughs> Asperger's, or... To me, that's how Sid seemed. He would hesitate before crossing the road, or he would do things, and. I don't know, he also seemed very sensitive. It was like if you made a sudden movement, a, a jerky movement, he would recoil and look paranoid. And yeah, so something was definitely wrong with him. He changed from a most beautiful, intelligent guy to another level of intelligence. He went somewhere else. Um, and I don't think anybody could ever reach him. I was very fond of him at one period, very impressed by him, felt very privileged to be in his company, to be sharing his life. And then it turned to being, God, he's a nightmare to be around. Uh, it's a tragedy and I can't coexist with this anymore. Uh, and then then there's like, well, how melodramatic was that? <laughs> and, you know, time changes everything. Um, let's say I feel very fortunate to have lived through that. Um, but it was just part of my life and it was ordinary and normal to me at the same time that my friends were creative and, uh, and talented and special. He was a shining character. I've never known anybody like him in my whole existence that shone, apart from probably the Dalai Lama. You know, he was such a charismatic person. He did shine. It, I mean, it was like electric sparks coming out of him when you saw him walking down the street. He just stood out in, in, in the crowd. Um, yeah, he was a very special man. Probably he could have been a guru if he put his mind to something else you know so why i don't know why people share this whole thing about Sid. he obviously had something that we don't have a lot of people just don't have he was a very special guy he was lovable Sid, without a shadow of doubt
off the 